I am being inundated with affordable 1440p gaming monitors, so is this one any good? Today we're looking at the MSI MAG 275CQRF-QD, which sports a curved 27-inch VA panel that operates a refresh rate of 170Hz. It also has support for adaptive sync technologies and is only HDR ready. Now the time of filming and in the UK can be found for just £300, while in the US it can be found for roughly $260. So in its review you can see if it's actually worth its price tag, and fundamentally how it compares to some of its key competitors. So to kick things off I would just like to point out that if you do want to achieve the maximum refresh rate at said resolution, you're going to have to be connected over DisplayPort via the 1.2 input. You can also connect over USB Type-C as well. If however you're going to be opting for HDMI, the monitor only has two HDMI 2.0 ports and therefore means that you'll be limited to 144Hz at 1440p. So with that out of the way, let's get on to its gaming performance. And while connected over DisplayPort, therefore getting 170Hz at 1440p, I had its input lag objectively tested at just 0.4 milliseconds. Yes indeed it does a tremendous job in this department, but the same could be said about a lot of modern monitors that I've recently tested. Now, while playing a game such as Counter-Strike 2, I had no issues whatsoever when it came to registering my mouse inputs. And therefore, subjectively, it does do a tremendous job, at least when it comes to the overall input lag. Now, while that's all very impressive, what about when it comes to its response time? Well, here, via the monitor's OSD, you've got a few different overdrive modes you can select from. Normal, fast, and fastest. Now, as you go up the scale, you'll get a faster response time of the monitor, but on the flip side, you'll get some more inverse ghosting, which will impair your overall vision and experience when it comes to using the monitor. Now, for me, to demonstrate this objectively, I'm using the OSRTD tool. Now, using the overdrive set to normal, and you can see at the bottom left-hand side of your screen, the average initial time, which translates to the average D2D, which is often quoted by manufacturers, you can see I clocked it in at 6.61 milliseconds, which isn't actually too shabby. However, it gets much better on the fast mode overdrive, which is the one I'd recommend, which is the average initial time sitting at just 4.2 milliseconds. Now above it, you can see that the percent in window sits at 76%, which is actually not too bad given the overall spec of this monitor. Now what I'd like to also draw your attention to is towards the middle of your screen, you'll see the RGB overshoot is zero or close to it. Now, as we transition onto the fastest mode preset, you can see that there's a lot more error, in other words, red on your screen. And yes, indeed, the RGB overshoot becomes a bit more noticeable. On the flip side, you've got a perfect percent in window of 100%, therefore you're getting off the transitions hitting that 170 hertz refresh rate window, but you've also got an incredible average initial time of just 2.25 milliseconds. So yes, indeed, the monitor is actually really responsive, at least in terms of its fastest mode preset. However, it's not recommended due to the amount of inverse ghosting that you'll get, which will really throw off your shots, be it if you're playing a game like Counter-Strike 2 or going on more visually appealing games. As such, I'd recommend the fast most presets, which actually is still pretty good in the grander scheme of things. In terms of the overall motion clarity, it's not too bad, at least for a curved 170Hz 1440p VA panel. However, you will find that motion clarity does become a lot better on some high refresh rate IPS monitors or let alone some TN panels out there. Now in terms of the overall VA smearing, it's just something I thought I should touch on because when it comes to gaming, it didn't throw me off. However, when it came to productivity, for example, looking at white text on a black background, which ironically is on MSI's own website, it was actually noticeable, even in terms of the fast mode preset. So you might actually want to dial down the overdrive to the normal mode, at least if you're going to be using this monitor for productivity. Now, when it comes to the overall motion clarity, we have also got MPRT mode. This really gives you a much clearer image and will be appealing for certain gamers out there. But the caveat is the MPRT mode does limit the brightness quite severely. And as a result means that you can only use MPRT mode if you're going to be using it in a completely pitch black room, at least in my opinion as in terms of running it in a bright sunlit room, I found that MPRT mode was not that usable because I couldn't really actually see my enemies on the screen, which is a little bit ironic. Now, MPRT mode also cannot be used simultaneously with adaptive sync technologies. In other words, AMD FreeSync or NVIDIA G-Sync, which is no real surprise because a lot of other monitors operate in such sort of way, but it's just something I thought I should highlight in this review. On that note, it perfectly brings me on to the adaptive sync technologies. The monitor will run AMD FreeSync technology, however in my case I've got an NVIDIA RTX 3080, and therefore when connected over DisplayPort, I was able to run NVIDIA G-Sync. 
However, it wasn't without any issues. I noticed a bit of flickering on the Nvidia Pendulum demo, and also noticed a little bit of flickering while playing a game such as Destiny 2. It wasn't overly severe, but just something I thought I should note. So therefore, if your eyes are sensitive to slight bits of flickering, then this might actually throw you off. Of course, your system might differ from mine, so you might not actually encounter any sorts of problems. Now, when it comes to its overall VR range, it sits from 48Hz up to 170Hz. And that's because the monitor does not have a native G-Sync module, therefore not giving you the full VR range. Yet again, no surprise because a lot of its competitors at this price point don't offer a native G-Sync module. Moving swiftly on, let's talk about HDR. And in all honesty, I was actually left pretty disappointed in this department. Not only does the monitor not actually reach a higher brightness level, but I felt that the overall HDR color accuracy was pretty poor. And as a result meant that when I was playing a game like Destiny 2, I actually preferred running it in an SDR image. And this is not only because the image popped a lot more, but it also gave me full control of the monitor, rather than it being locked due to the overall HDR signal controlling the overall brightness and indeed some of the other settings. So for me to conclude the gaming section, I would like to talk about console usage. And here the monitor will be able to run 1440p at 120Hz, or of course at 1080p as well, and indeed at 60Hz if you so wish. Now, I actually put it through its paces via the OSRT tool, and here at 120Hz you can see that on the fast mode preset, which yet again is recommended, I clocked in an average initial time of 3.93 milliseconds, which is actually very good. On its fastest mode preset, you can see this drops down to 2.25 milliseconds, but indeed you have got a lot more RGB overshoot. At 60 Hz on the fast mode preset, it sits at 4.85 milliseconds, and at the fastest mode preset, it drops down to 3.01 milliseconds. Here, actually, I found that at 60 Hz, it doesn't do too bad in terms of the RGB overshoot. Now, for me to yet again demonstrate it, I'm using the UFO ghosting test. And you can see over here that at 120 Hz, there's a bit of inverse ghosting, specifically towards the lighter shades, while it's not as noticeable at 60 Hz. Elsewhere, I would like to point out that MPRT is available at 120Hz, and yet again it will lock the brightness, however at 60Hz is unavailable, which is no surprise. To conclude, I would also like to mention that the monitor does accept a 4K signal input, and therefore via my 4K Blu-ray player, I was able to run 4K at 60Hz with HDR enabled. So its gaming performance is a little bit hit and miss, and the same could be said about its overall image quality. Now first off, I would just like to remind you that it is running a 27-inch form factor, a 1000R curvature with a VA panel, operating a resolution of 1440p and a refresh rate of up to 170Hz. It also has a matte coating to it. Now via the monitor's OSD, you've actually got a few dedicated modes, and while they're a little bit convoluted, if you do go to the appropriate section, you will find an sRGB, Adobe RGB and Display P3, which is actually quite a rarity the latter being quite important for those people running it with a Mac system. Now, using the sRGB mode to start off with, you'll be able to notice that the gamut coverage and gamut volume were tested at 89.7% and 93.9% respectively. You can see below how it compares to the sRGB standard. The average delta E sits at 1.73 and a maximum of 3.68, therefore it can be used for some light image editing work and video grading. Its test with contrast ratio is very impressive, although it's no surprise given it's a VA panel at 3546 to 1. As for its gamma curve, it also sits pretty close to the 2.2 standard. Now where things get a little bit weird is when it comes to the overall white point. In comparison to the 6504 Kelvin target, it was recorded at a stonkingly high 8004 Kelvin at 100%. Yes indeed, it is completely weird. So much so that I dug a little bit into it, and you'll be able to see over here that the graph in the sRGB mode was completely off what it should be. In case you're wondering, no, there is actually no means of actually adjusting the color temperature, at least when you are in the likes of the sRGB mode. Now the same could be said about the Adobe RGB and the Display P3 modes, so clearly there's something going wrong. Speaking of which over here, let's dig into the Adobe RGB results. Here you can see that the gamut coverage and the gamut volume have been positively affected in said mode. It's sitting at 82.7% and 84.2% respectively. Below you can see how it compares to the Adobe RGB standard. As for the average LTE, it sits at 1.65 and a maximum of 3.77, which is actually pretty impressive for a gaming panel. This test with contrast ratio doesn't change, and yet again over here the measured white point sits at a really high 8047 Kelvin at 100%. Yet again, its gamma curve sits pretty close to the 2.2 standard. 
As for the display P3 mode, here you can see that the gamut coverage and gamut volumes have been positively affected across the board. And looking at the DCI P3 mode, which is the closest to display P3, you can see how it compares to said standards. The average delta and the maximum delta, however, are a little bit worse at 1.53 and 4.51 respectively. And as for its measured white point, yet again, it actually gets even worse at 8,320 Kelvin at 100% yet again in comparison to the 6,500 Kelvin target. As for its gamma curve, it seems pretty close to the 2.2 standard, although it goes a little bit weird towards the higher end. Past the overall color performance, let's talk about brightness. And yes indeed, in HDR I clocked in 245 nits, which is actually pretty disappointing. The same could be said in SDR, clocking in at 240 nits, and therefore means that the monitor will have to be pretty much run at 100% brightness, at least if you're running it in a bright sunlit room. As for its minimum brightness, it does get all the way down to 21 nits, showing fantastic range, and therefore means if you're going to be using it in a completely pitch black room, you'll actually appreciate the fact that this monitor gets actually really dim. It is worth noting, however, that in MPRT, we'll lock the brightness to just 84 nits, and as such means that you won't be actually able to use this monitor in a bright sunlit room with MPRT mode enabled. Elsewhere, the overall brightness uniformity of this monitor is not too bad, although on my tester's panel, which I do appreciate is somewhat lottery, you can see at the top right hand side it's a little bit off. As for the overall backlight bleed, I did actually notice a little bit of clouding, as you're able to see from these images that we're taking with 100% brightness and in a completely pitch black room. Suffice to say, there's some other VA panels out there that actually do a little bit better. But this VA panel will certainly do a lot better job in comparison to some IPS monitors that do suffer from some backlight bleed. As we shift our attention away from the tests, I should talk about the overall build quality. And here the monitor has got that 1000R curvature, which does add a little bit of extra immersion if that's something that you're looking for on a 27 inch monitor. Now you have also got a three side borderless design with a relatively thin bottom bezel. The stand itself is actually very sturdy, although it's very limited because you've only got height and tilt adjustments. Therefore, if you want some pivot or swivel adjustments, you'll want to replace the stand, which you can do so via a Visa compatible stand, allowing you to mount it on a monitor arm or a multi-monitor setup. Now at the back of the monitor, you might have noticed that there's an RGB light. And yes, indeed, this strip can be disabled if you so wish, because I do find it completely pointless. Nonetheless, if that's something you want to enable, you can do so via the monitor's OSD. Speaking of which, they can be accessed via a small little joystick button that's found at the back right hand side of the monitor, making it actually very easy to access. The monitor's OSD is also very responsive and also very detailed. However, it is worth noting over here that I do find that the color modes are a little bit convoluted, so I wish that MSI would actually address this. The same sort of complaints were said about other MSI monitors. Now the monitor's OSD does actually have a further extension because you've also got the MSI gaming intelligence software, which gives you a further degree of customization. For example, if you do want to adjust the RGB lighting behavior, you can do so. And that's actually very much appreciated and at least will be good for certain users who would actually rather use a software rather than fiddling around with the little joystick button. Elsewhere, I would just like to point out that the monitor has got a built-in KVM switch, which is actually quite a rarity at this price point. This effectively allows you to plug in your mouse and keyboard directly into the monitor and switch between sources, such as a laptop and a desktop computer. Quite handy for those people using it for productivity. If you want some more information about what a KVM switch actually does, make sure you check it up on your proper banner or follow the links down in the description below. Aside from all this, I would just like to highlight that the monitor has not got any built-in speakers, which doesn't really bother me in the slightest. But if you do want to route audio directly via the monitor, you have got a 3.5mm headphone jack output, allowing you to plug in your headphones directly into the monitor. So with all that in mind, it brings me on to my verdict. And truthfully, this monitor has got some pros and cons. But even at its relatively cheap price point, I do think that you should look elsewhere, be it in terms of investing a little bit more on a 1440p IPS 240Hz monitor offered by MSI themselves, or looking at the likes of what AOC or indeed HP can offer. The ones I'd recommend will be down in the description below for you in consideration. Now I'd be curious to know what you'd make of this monitor down in the comment section below. And of course, if you've enjoyed this detailed independent review, do consider dropping a like, subscribing and hitting that bell notification. All of which are very much appreciated and allows me to continue delivering honest reviews like this one. As such, I've been totally dubbed and I'll hopefully see you in the next one. Take care of yourselves and goodbye.